Thanks so much for coming, everyone. Uh, we've got slides up, excellent. My name is David Cottingham. I'm a security consultant from uh, Canberra, and my background is really in federal government. So, hence my interest in everything in the Essential Eight and the Information Security Manual. I'm the co-founder of the application whitelisting company, uh, Airlock Digital. That company was really made because I was going around to many federal government agencies deploying application whitelisting using a variety of technologies. And typically I would come back within sort of one or two weeks after deployment, answering questions, babying the solution. And I was building a lot of tool sets to solve the problem, wrapping around other vendors' products. And uh, basically already built half a product. So we decided to take it the full way, make application whitelisting a lot easier. I'm the author of the uh, SANS Top 4 Mitigation Strategies course, which is now very much out of date and needs an update to the Essential 8. But basically that course was teaching security practitioners the practical information that they needed in an environment to implement these strategies. Because there was the advice from ASD saying, you need to do these things. And there was advice from Pentester saying, I can break, well, I wouldn't call it advice. I can break anything that you do, so what's the point? So there was none of that mid-level information that you know, real world people that are doing this stuff need. And um, my focus and interest is really on endpoint security. I really, really enjoy it. So what's this talk today about? Um, really, it's about some tips and tricks and things that I've learned deploying the Essential 8 over um, the last sort of 10 years um, down in Canberra. And one of the main things that I always talk about is the Essential 8 isn't easy, um, but it is really worth doing. You do get the biscuit at the end of the day if you jump in and uh, get these controls right. And the reason that they're not like uh, any other uh, strategy, strategies is because they require ongoing maintenance. This isn't something that you deploy antivirus, you install in your environment, you set and forget. And that's why they're called strategies, right? They require maintenance, a bit of upkeep, but definitely don't let that put you off. Also, no single product can perform these strategies. You can't just install something and it will take care of it for you. They're manual processes. However, a product or a framework can significantly improve your success and lower the manageability uh, or improve the manageability of these controls. And organizations that get, implement the Essential 8 gain a significant security benefit. How much of a benefit? I'm sure you've all seen these, uh, this slide. Basically, ASD, when this was their advice from the top four, saying that if you implement the top four strategies, it mitigates at least 85% of targeted cyber intrusions uh, that they see. And speaking to people from ASD, 85% is a really conservative estimate. Uh, there's some standards from Homeland Security um, called the National Cybersecurity and Communication Integration Center. And they say that basically 98% of the incidents that they responded to in 2014 and 2015 would have been mitigated by implementing a similar seven strategies as the eight that ASD are talking about. What are they? The proactive security strategies informed by ASD's operational experience in the field. They're designed to proactively detect intrusions, reduce the risk of an intrusion, reduce the damage if an intrusion does occur on your network, so reduce the time to detection. And one that people don't often talk about, which is increasing the cost of intrusion for the bad guys, right? So your adversaries run a business too. If you make it cost prohibitive for them to attack you, then they're gonna go elsewhere effectively. And just to complicate things a little bit, there's also a maturity scale applied to each one of these eight strategies. Zero from you haven't done it at all or you're not aligned with the intent of the control to four, which is full high risk environment. You've implemented it to the letter of the standard. So application whitelisting is the number one strategy and it's one that I'm probably most familiar and uh, enjoy the most. And the intent of application whitelisting is to remove code execution on your system or untrusted code execution on your systems. And the reason you want to do this is to prevent the bad guys from using the tools that they need to carry out their attacks. So for example, if there's an actor inside your environment, they might want to download an FTP tool to exfiltrate data from your environment. If you prevent them from being able to do that, it significantly limits their capability of the things that they can do. And it makes attackers do what's called live off the land. So they need to use functionality that inherently exists inside your environment in order to carry out their objectives. Many security, uh, the security community has been talking about this a lot lately and they call it lol bins or living off the land binary. So these are uh, functions inside Windows that you can use in order to do sort of nefarious or, or interesting things. The challenges of whitelisting are really, it's a technical control, right? It, 
typically requires very uh, sort of focused security people to go in, implement whitelisting, understand it, and build a process for the business that they can manage. However, many organizations fail with whitelisting because it is largely really technical. And in the real world, um, security people aren't the ones that are managing the whitelist. Typically, organizations want to pass that off as an operational control to the server team or some other business area. That's the challenge that we've really tried to solve with Airlock, is taking that technical complexity out of whitelisting. And also the challenges are business processes really need to be thought about before you try and tackle whitelisting. So for example, if someone brings in a USB key with a new piece of software into your environment and that user wants to run it, what's the process about how they get that approved? And what's the process uh, in which an organization reviews the software, decides whether it's trusted and updates the whitelist? And who's responsible for doing that in various areas? And that's also a big challenge to actually map out and assign those responsibilities. In terms of auditing application whitelisting, how do you know whether it's done well? Um, in my consulting work, I built a number of tools to sort of demonstrate this because it is such a technical control. But what we've done at Airlock is we built an application whitelisting auditor that's free, and I'll have links at the end of the talk that you can go and download that. Um, but basically, you run it on your systems. It will spray binaries all over your system, and it will tell you where they've been successfully able to execute. So it will show you where there's gaps in your policy or security risks. In terms of maturity, audit mode is zero for whitelisting. So if you're not actively blocking untrusted files from running, ASD say you get a zero, no biscuit. And um, maturity level is four, which is if you're only allowing files to run based on their cryptographic hash value, which is a very challenging thing to do. To demonstrate this challenge, a lot of people, uh, this is taken from uh, the SANS course that I wrote. Basically, uh, a lot of people say, hey, how about you just whitelist Adobe Reader, which is represented by the top box out there. That doesn't sound very hard, right? Well, if you're doing application whitelisting uh, well of executables and DLLs and scripts, you need to actually whitelist each individual application component. And that's represented by the bottom square down there. And I actually, I think this was for Adobe Reader 11. I went through and counted every single executable file that was part of that, that application. And you have to add sort of that many rules represented by each box to make the application run. It's not quite as, as simple as um, it, it may seem from the outset. Now, this video was uh, taken from a federal government agency that I was doing some work for fairly recently. Basically, it's the majority of attacks that we're still seeing out there, right? It's, this is an OLE object embedded inside a Word document. And basically, it was a phishing email that came in. You double click on it. And what it does is it just drops an executable to the system and runs it. And this is how a lot of people are still getting compromised in today's day and age, right? So it's um, really raising the bar from, from these type of attacks that are still working is what we need to do. Deployment tips for application whitelisting. Step one, decide on the maturity level of whitelisting that you want to achieve. So I said before that zero was audit mode, four was full hash base. We need to decide as an organization before deploying, okay, do I want to whitelist executables? Do I want to whitelist scripts? How much maintenance am I, am I prepared to suffer uh, as part of the whitelist? And um, where do we want to be as an organization? And based on that maturity, that will allow you to evaluate the application whitelisting technologies a lot better. So you can ask more specific questions about, okay, if I want to whitelist to this level of maturity, you know, does your product support that? And how does that look in a real world scenario? Once you've evaluated the technology and you've understood any limitations that may be present, uh, it's about developing those business processes. So map out those scenarios. Say, okay, when a user brings in a new piece of software that was you know, unknown to me, I didn't know that we're bringing it in, how am I gonna deal with that scenario? Allow the user to get on with what they need to do and verify that that's legitimate and update my application whitelist. And then step four is actually going about deploying that solution. I was having a discussion on, on, on Twitter. I showed this deployment tips to um, a guy called Casey Smith, which is doing a lot of work um, on what we call lull bins. And basically, he's very passionate about this, as you can tell by the all caps. But he's basically venting frustration that a lot of organizations just allow executables and DLLs to just run on their networks. So number two, patching applications. And I know there's a question that you're all asking right now, which is, what are applications? <laughs> But uh, I put that up there because it's a really important question that nobody asks um, uh, until they're having a debate later on about, do we need to patch this? Is it really an application underneath the ASD guidelines? But basically, an application, it's important to define. It's 
anything that sort of runs on top of the system. So typically we've got Office, executables, any applications traditionally, middleware, IIS, web servers, any developed code that's on top of your system as well it may have security vulnerabilities in it that you do need to update and fix. Things like web browsers. And once we've defined that, it becomes a lot easier uh, to have the discussion about what we need to patch and update. So the intent of patching applications is quite obvious, right? It's removing known security vulnerabilities from your system. However, there are a number of challenges here. Threat intelligence is one. So it's understanding when the latest zero day is floating around on the internet for an application that affects you. How are we going to understand when new significant security vulnerabilities come out for the applications that we have installed? The challenge is also just understanding what applications you have in your environment. So building an inventory of those applications is challenging performing risk assessments, and I'll talk about that uh, in a couple of slides time. Um, performing application packaging and deployment and rapidly deploying applications is challenging. In terms of auditing, it's kind of difficult. You really need enterprise tools out there. There used to be this great tool from Flexera called the Personal Software Inspector, which has now been discontinued. But Flexera is generally a pretty good company to um, uh, do uh, software auditing, and there's a number of other enterprise tools out there. Um, but as an auditor, you really want to go in and just do sample auditing of various endpoints within the organization to say, show me a list of what applications you have installed, and then go and check whether you know, they're up to date, and things like that. ASD say on a maturity scale that if you patch greater than a monthly basis, you get a score of zero, which is quite harsh. But um, if you apply a patch within 48 hours, you actually get a maturity level of three. In terms of a real world example, this was taken from a federal government agency many years ago now. And basically it was an Adobe Reader exploit that was very, very new at the time. Uh, and really uh, this email and these examples like it are why um, many of you that may be familiar with the top 37 strategies, why user education went from back in the day from like number 10 down to I think it was like number 27, which was very contentious at the time. But basically social engineering and phishing is so good nowadays, you can't really teach users not to click on things. And I know that's probably uh, some of you would disagree with me on that. But um, uh, in this case, we had just patched Adobe Reader from a recent vulnerability that was using and were able to not be susceptible to that, that particular attack. Deployment tips. Step one, you need to generate or create a vulnerability risk determination policy. And I know that sounds really, really dry, and it kind of is, but um, this is about making sure that you have a standard process to assess, okay, we there's a zero day that's out in the wild that has remote code execution, and we are vulnerable to it. How do we assess that risk? Know it's really risky for us, and then what has the business agreed is the time frame to patch that vulnerability, right? So if Microsoft releases a critical, it's applied to us, you might have a policy that says we need to patch that within two days, or we might say that based on our assessment, uh, you know, we have a month to patch this vulnerability. And what, what it does having that in policy before you actually go about this is basically avoiding those arguments in change control, if you have it in the larger organizations about why is this so important you know, you're not really articulating this to the business. So it's making sure that you have a clear, defined way of communicating risk and also the uh, responsibility of timeframes to patching. Step two, inventory your applications. Understand what applications you have out there in the environment. Step three, patch intelligence advisory. So it's sort of trying to get information about when vulnerabilities exist for those applications that you have. And if you're not buying a service to do this, a really effective way actually is to just subscribe to basically security response feeds, things uh, like you know the Microsoft Security Response Center on Twitter, um, the Adobe uh, Security Research Team, and try and work with your major vendors to understand how do you let me know when vulnerabilities come out and have a process for getting that in? And step four, deploying your patches. Number three is configuring Microsoft Office macro settings. And macros um, over the last five years really increased in prevalence. And uh, basically the idea is to prevent the download and dropping of malware. Macros are pretty much used as a malware delivery mechanism into your environment. And the challenges there are, is just user acceptance. So it's terrifying as a security person for you to just turn off all the macros across the organization without really understanding how the organization's using macros in the first place. Because they're quite well used in the typical business and so many business areas do weird and wonderful things with them. 
As an auditor, uh, basically you need to look at the Office Trust Center settings inside the Microsoft Office applications to determine what the macro uh, settings are set to. And also I've written uh, an Office uh, hardening auditing script that's available on my GitHub. The link will be at the end of this presentation. That basically you can run it and it will tell you what the macro settings and postures are of all the different Office applications inside your environment. Maturity is uh, zero if you have user configurable settings. So if you don't actually enforce macro settings in the registry or via group policy, ASD consider that to be a zero. And the reason being is even though by default, the Office application will say that macros are disabled with a notification, users can just go in and change that. So they consider it to provide you know, no security benefit um, at all. Um, and maturity level three is macros in trusted locations can execute. And I'll talk about trusted locations. Basically trusted locations in Office, uh, folder paths or network shares where any document that's inside those locations can execute without any security restrictions. And what the majority of organizations do is they'll go into Office and they'll put in every single file share inside their organization as a trusted location to say that all of the documents when they're run from here can run you know, regardless of what all my other security settings are. And it, cre it sort of works on this uh, scenario where uh, basically if you receive a malicious email that contains a macro, you double click on it or the user double clicks on it, it's not running from one of those trusted locations. So the macro will be disabled. However, if the user needs it, then they can save that, copy that into their, you know, their home drive and then run it. Um, not perfect, but it's the unfortunately the best thing we've got in terms of office uh, security configuration settings. So uh, definitely work with trusted locations because it can get allow you to disable macros in some scenarios, even if you're a macro heavy organization. You can do auditing with uh, office telemetry. So there's an ability in office to spin up a telemetry server and get an idea about what documents your users are handling and what features of Office they're using, including the amount of macro use. So that can provide you a little bit of insight into how many macros are actually out there in the organization before you just go and turn it off. And also remember to disable it per product. Macro settings aren't something that you just go, hey, in Office I'm gonna turn this off. Microsoft Access for some reason has macro settings. I don't know why or what you could do with it, but um, you, it's important to go through the whole suite, even Visio and everything, and make sure that you've got all those settings turned off across the board. But that, um, that auditing script will really help you with that. Number four, user application hardening. Um, this is basically to configure different products that are inside your organization to reduce the attack surface of applications that load untrusted content. So it's any applications that open files from the internet, browse content from the internet, or any sort of external source. So web browsers, um, office productivity applications, things like that. The challenges of user application hardening is it typically reduces user functionality. They might use some features that you are turning off. And the challenges are also attaining hardening information from vendors. Unless you're talking about the really big vendors like Microsoft, uh, Google, they typically don't provide a lot of information about how to harden their products or run it in the most secure configuration possible. And I definitely encourage you all to speak to your vendors and basically ask them, okay, how do I harden your application? And if I want to run it in a secure configuration, what does that look like? And see what type of response that you get from them. And also one of the challenges, but also one of the, I guess it's kind of easy in some organizations as well, is blocking advertisements. Um, ASD say that it, one good thing to harden web browsers is to block all advertising at your proxy and I'll explain why that is in a second. Um, auditing, it's really about checking group policy and registry settings. Um, as I said, the hardening script which I've made helps with a number of those products and also look at the ASD hardening guides that they provide. They provide a lot of guides for, for Office, um, Internet Explorer and, and a lot of different products. The maturity is if you allow Flash and web adverts to run and Java's in your browser, you get a maturity level of zero. And the reason why they say if you allow web adverts, you get a maturity level of zero is because advertising networks have, especially in the last two years, really been used to deliver malicious content to end computers and users. There was, I think it was about four months ago, there was an issue where an advertiser managed to get uh, cryptocurrency JavaScript miners running on YouTube. So people would go to watch YouTube videos and then their computer would be doing mining through them, delivered through an advertising network. And it's becoming an increasingly big attack vector. 
Maturity level four is you've hardened your web browsers, you've disconnected Flash from the browser, you've got no Java, and also you're blocking adverts. So what I would say for deploying is step one is use a proxy if you have one to block advertising content. If you don't have a proxy, then maybe try and use some you know, uh, extensions on your browser to actually block advertising from loading. Step two, blocking Flash and unlinking Java from the web browser. I know it's easier said than done, um, but uh, Flash is becoming less prevalent all the time. So next time you're doing your operating system refresh, maybe Windows 10, you can try and get that in as, as, as a new sort of requirement. Um, step three, implement the Office Hardening Guide if you use Microsoft Office from um, ASD. And step four, harden the web browsers based on uh, uh, a lot of the vendor guidance. Um, Chrome, uh, Internet Explorer, um, Firefox say there's some good guides out there about how to actually improve the security of those platforms. Number five, restrict administrative privileges. And the intent of this is to prevent adversaries, the bad guys, from gaining administrative access on your systems in the first place. And can anyone tell me what is an administrator? Anyone? Have a guess? Yeah, anyone with privileged access, which is essentially sort of the same question again. It's, it's like, what is privileged access? And this is something that it's really hard to define. And what I usually define it as with, uh, uh, with customers is to say that I think an administrator is any account that has the ability to change the configuration of software or systems on your endpoints. So if they can modify your system in some way, then it's administrative access. And if you think admin of administrative access in that way, it really changes the scope of what is restricted administrative uh, privileges. But it's easy to have a base point like that definition to work from. Challenges are identifying what access is required from users and also the business processes for obtaining access. So it's important to have some sort of defined process in your organization to say, hey, if this administrator is starting and they need access, what access do they need? How do I provide it? And also, how do I review um, that every so often? And also, there's, there's a requirement on the Australian government that says you need to use separate administrative workstations inside your organisation, which I haven't personally seen done before. But um, uh, basically, the idea is that you have two terminals on your desks, and you have a standard user account and an administrative user account, and you only use the administrative user account on the workstation that doesn't have internet or email on it. The reason being is because if you have one computer with a standard user account, you remote desktop to somewhere else, you type in your administrative credentials. If there's a keylogger on that machine, they're going to capture all that information and get your administrative account anyway. So it makes sense. It's just implementing that from a practical point of view can be quite tricky. And there's a number of approaches that you can do, which are probably a little bit simpler than having two physical PCs. Auditing, Bloodhound is the best thing that has happened in the last two years. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, if you're an auditor, you want to look at the business processes. So you want to go into an organization and you want to say, tell me uh, how people get administrative access. So if I was to request domain administrator, what do I need to do to, to get that access? Um, and also, what checks do you have in place? How often do you review that access? Can you show me your last access review that you've done inside the organization? You can have a look at their privileged access management solution. And that management solution may not be a full-blown product. It may be Active Directory. So have a look at whatever uh, the organization uses to delegate and provide access. And also have a look um, at um, their proxy. Make sure that administrators are blocked from gaining access to the internet. Um, the maturity is privileged accounts uh, browsing the internet or email. Uh, you get a zero. And uh, if you get a maturity level three, if you have some sort of privileged access management solution in place, you only grant that access when required and you perform regular audits of administrative access. So Bloodhound, this is something that uh, a number of extremely talented uh, researchers uh, released at DEF CON about two years ago. And it's designed to scan your Active Directory environment and basically map out your permission models inside Active Directory and identify attack paths. It's designed for red teams. And basically, what it's designed to do, it's completely open source and free, is you go into the organization, you scan their Active Directory, and that's, you only generally need a standard user account to actually do this. You take all their information about, from their Active Directory and you go away for two weeks and you study all the attack paths and which users you need to attack to get to your particular objectives. 
It's very visual and um, it's free, as I said, and built for red teams. So if you're not using it, the bad guys are, I highly encourage you to at least scan your environment and have a look what's in there. It only takes about 10 minutes to run. It is a fantastic tool. And that's sort of what the attack paths look like inside Bloodhound. So you can see, okay, if I need to get to domain administrator, I need to attack this particular user over in finance who has access to this group or this machine, then I can jump onto that machine and then a domain administrative account might be logged onto that machine, steal their session. And you can build up these amazing charts about how your privileged access model is performed. So can't recommend it enough. So deployment tips, step one, audit with Bloodhound. Um, step two, uh, block administrative accounts from accessing the internet and email. So don't associate email addresses with your administrative accounts and block them from going through the proxy if you have one. Step three, validate and remove privileged accounts on a regular basis. Um, and that's trying to do them sort of at least once every six months. And this might be as simple as having a whole stack of paper that this person has signed that they've got an administrative account and then you go to the top of the stack and then you check it. Yes, they're still here. Yes, they still need the access and they move it to the bottom of the pile. Um, you know, there's better ways to do it, but um, it's just having some sort of process in place. And step four, obviously, when you're getting to a really mature state, it's providing only the access that's required for administrators as they need it. A one bonus I put down there is removing enterprise and schema administrators um, from your environment and only providing people schema and enterprise admin when they need it. Typically, these rights are only needed when you're doing a big Active Directory schema uh, and admin changes. So, and also, those groups are set up. So if you are a domain administrator, you always have rights over those groups. Those groups don't have you know, some sort of god right over your, uh, your Active Directory instance. Well, they allow you to do certain things. But don't be afraid that you can't put users back in once you've moved them out, because domain administrators have that privilege. Number six, patching operating systems. The idea here, as, as expected, is prevent adversaries from using vulnerabilities to get more privileges on your system. So typically operating system vulnerabilities these days, because operating systems are getting increasingly hardened against attacks, is adversaries use it to get administrator access when they only have standard user access. And remove classes of exploits through features. And this can be seen in Windows 10 with all the new feature updates. Microsoft's doing a lot of fantastic work to bring new security features into the actual operating system. But just like applications, we've got another question, which is what is an operating system? And uh, according to ASD, operating systems are basically anything that runs on sort of a network device. Um, as well as what you would think of an operating system like Windows and Linux on a computer as well. And it's challenging to update and maintain your network devices. Auditing, um, really there's a whole bunch of scanning tools out there. Typically in an enterprise, usually what I say is, you know, go use Nessus if you don't have it already. It's reasonable and, um, you know, it does a good job of actually inventorying your, your, your uh, environment. Maturity is if you've got unsupported operating systems in your environment, like Windows XP and Server 2003, you get a maturity level of zero. And also um, maturity level of three if you're only using vendor supported operating systems and you're doing rapid patch cycles. So pretty straightforward, that one. Multi-factor authentication. Um, the intent here is to limit adversary access through credential stealing, right? So uh, if a if your credentials get stolen from your environment, then it's pretty much game over. Um, there was a situation that I was aware of a number of years ago where what an organization got compromised by a state actor, um, all of their usernames and passwords were completely stolen. And what uh, the organization had to do was basically disconnect the internet connection, bring down their whole environment and reset every single password over the weekend and then bring their environment back up again. What, because the attacker knew all the usernames and passwords, they went, hmm, is the password for this particular account that was password one, I wonder if that's now password two when they've reset it. And they were unfortunately right. So they logged, just logged straight back into the environment after the reset by incrementing, you know, uh, choose your credential. And then they had to reset and do the whole environment all over again. So multi-factor authentication, particularly on your remote access, any, any ability to get remotely into your systems, it's a must these days to have remote access or multi-factor on there. Um, and the challenges are just user acceptance and the technology integration there. Uh, auditing is viewing the logon methods. So uh, if you're an auditor, you can go into an organization and say, show me how you access this environment from home. 
if you can, and making sure they jump through a multi-factor access point. And also ask, okay, if you as an administrator need to do something on your servers, how do you do that? And watch them jump through um, uh, that uh, process and make sure they hit a multi-factor point. Maturity, you don't use multi-factor zero. Three is multi-factor for remote access, privileged accounts, and accessing sensitive data. And ASD call out no SMS. And this is something that security community is talking about a lot lately, where we're recognizing that SMS is not a secure out-of-band multi-factor token method for delivery anymore. So we can't use that. Deployment tips. Step one, enable it for your remote access solutions. Multi-factor is typically very easily natively integrated into these platforms. And then what I would do is have a look at technologies that you can use out there from vendors to actually do your internal systems. Step three, network design. And what I mean by that is you aren't going to install a multi-factor client on every single server inside your environment. It's just not going to be practical. So what I would suggest instead is designing your network so there's sort of jump hosts or choke points inside your network. So in order to get to the server zone, you need to go to this particular server or endpoint first before jumping into your actual uh, server environment. And that makes multi-factor implementation a significant amount easier because they have to, a user has to go through that check at least once. And then step four, implement that solution. Number eight, pretty straightforward, is daily backup your data. Uh, it, the intent is recovery in the event of security incident. And this is really driven by ransomware and the uptick in uh, you know, data loss. So your organization's not held to ransom. The challenges are really cost and also the access that typical backup solutions need inside your environment. So many times I've seen organizations deploy backup solutions where they've just given the backup account domain admin access and it's logging onto every single server um, basically, you know, doing, doing those backups. And that's a real problem because if you run Bloodhound in your environment, you'll see that you can pretty much steal domain administrative access from any single server that your backup account is backing up. So, um, you know, getting that privilege reduction tends to be really tricky. So if you're talking to a vendor that does your backups, definitely ask them what privileges do you need in order to, to you know, back up data. Auditing, observe their backups, make sure that they've got a process to actually um, do the backup of that data and make sure that they've previously tried to recover their data. There's a lot of people that don't um, uh, basically test their recovery processes. The maturity, ASD say that if you back up less than monthly and you've never tested a recovery that you get a maturity level of zero, um, but maturity level of three is you're performing offline backups, you're performing backups daily and you're testing a full recovery. And I know that that is quite a challenge in many scenarios. And if you do all that, you can become like OPSEC Harold and identify malware on your network. And Harold, as, as many of you would know, lives in a very interesting space where he's not happy or sad, just like many security researchers, when you identify something good, but it's also bad at the same time. Resources, Bloodhound, um, definitely check that out. Um, that is a must-have tool. Uh, the Airlock application whitelisting auditor that I talked about before to audit your application whitelist can be found on our website, airlockdigital.com. Um, also check out the ASD hardening guides. They're invaluable and fantastic for hardening your, um, your solutions. They're free. And also the scripts to do auditing against those hardening guides. So if you go to my GitHub there, I've got a script that checks your Windows 10 deployment and tells you which controls in the hardening guide you're compliant with and which ones you're not. And also the Office 2016 uh, hardening as well. It will tell you where the macros are enabled and what features you have set and which ones you don't. And I'm working on those all the time. So definitely check back regularly and, and there's lots of improvements there. So I guess we're at that point. Any questions? Yeah, so I have a mic here. So if, does anyone have any questions? We've got a few minutes for questions. Just a quick one. The evaluated products list uh, lists uh, REL 7.1 yep. with um, LSPP hmm. protection profile. Yes. Well, I'm puzzled. How does this fit? Oh, I'm not seeing much LSPP protection profile at EAL 4 Plus hmm. out there in the marketplace. Are you seeing any at all? Because everything we've said here yeah, was solved 15 years ago with uh, with the uh, with uh, FMAC, yes. Mandatory Access Control, B2, through to OS LSPP, yes. which is a defined protection profile yes. for the server environment. Yeah. But I'm not seeing much out there. Are you seeing any? Not, not really. I guess it's, uh, 
whether it's practical for organizations to run those systems and get the functionality that they need, right? Well, so, uh, but there is, is definitely a disconnect there. I mean, it's sort of outside my scope to sort of talk in depth too much about it, but there is definitely a disconnect there between the certification process and also, hey, you need to update your operating systems to the latest version as soon as possible. So the certification tends to be a little bit behind, but no, I'm not really seeing those sort of hardened platforms out there too much. Yeah, the Red Hat 7.1, you're not seeing much RHEL 7.1 out there. Much, not a huge As amount. a server. Yes. Thanks for the question. Uh, any other questions? Just a quick one on the uh, SMS on the 2FA. Yep. What are the options of valid like, OAuth on mobile? Yep. Yeah, OAuth on mobile is fine because there's a push notification to the actual device and that's done sort of by a secure channel. So you would need to compromise the device in order to get that OAuth, whereas I think the SMS out of band is really about the vulnerabilities with telcos. So it's the ability to do SIM swaps um, and you know try and get the SMS not from your device but through some other method of porting numbers and, and that's, that process is still a bit too sketchy um, to be a valid method. So anything that sort of delivers the code out of band through another mechanism to the end device and has some validation that that's the user on the other end is, is okay. Yep, one more question. Um, you, you had patching OSs. Um, what about stuff lower level than that? Um, so things like your device drivers, your, your firmware, your TPM, all of that kind of stuff, uh, yes. which we've seen quite a bit of action on in the past uh, year or so. Yes. Yeah, I think there's no particular guidance about updating that stuff. And, and I guess as an auditor, mo most auditors when they would go into agencies wouldn't be looking that low level. So I guess it's as a due diligence piece, you know, I guess the whole standard's inferring that, hey, we need to update everything that's at this lower level uh, in terms of whether it will be checked or not. I guess it's about risk, right? So if there is a significant vulnerability in a TPM module that could be exploited remotely and does affect you, then that's when you would say, okay, we're going to adhere to this standard. And that's where the risk management sort of or vulnerability determination policy that I talked about is really important because then you can just bundle that under that risk and say, hey, this is critical to us, we need to fix this, regardless of what the nitty gritty definitions are. Okay, thanks very much. Let's uh, give David a hand for the great presentation. Cool, thanks.